Good morning. Praise the Lord. How is everybody doing? Right in the chats where you're from. Uh, and we'll do a little check, make sure you can hear me. I'll know if you start typing where you're from. Uh, I'll know you'll be able to hear me just fine. Oh. Right, Los Angeles, Florida, Alaska, Texas, uh, more Texas, New York, McKinney. Hey, we're in McKinney right now. Uh, Mumbal, London, Mexico. Uh, oh man, what a treasure! What a treat! This uh, this humbles me. Uh, lets me know that this information is so uh, desired and desirable right now. And um, I um, just feel honored that I get to share it with you. So that's very awesome. Uh, if you're if you're uh, just coming in right now, uh, do share where you're from. And um, <clears throat> when we share this later, we'll be able to uh, hopefully communicate with each other. So hi, welcome. I'm Nicholas Bergner. And even if you have zero training uh, in, in gardening or anything like this, you're going to learn easy ways uh, to work with nature and to produce resources. And in this particular class, we're gonna talk about resources such as food, but as far as permaculture is concerned, we're gonna be talking about life and to have it more abundantly and resources such as that, food, water, shelter, and energy. And today I'm gonna to show you that you can learn and even start integrating the foundations of permaculture garden, gardening into your life. So. I'm very excited to see you here. And um, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm Nicholas Bergner. I'm the director of the School of Permaculture uh, based out of uh, North Texas and Plano, Texas. However, our farm's uh, just a little bit away. Uh, permaculture is a, a design system that works with nature, the patterns of nature, to help you provide as many resources as you can. Those same resources being food, water, shelter, energy, community, um, love, but, but it's doing it in such a way where it integrates into your daily life and it doesn't enslave you into your landscape or your property, uh, much as, um, the way it has in the past when we utilized agriculture and farming techniques back then. So there's nothing new in permaculture. So that's actually very good. It's very good to know that, uh, actually we can look at it like, Permaculture is really a reminder of indigenous wisdom uh, with appropriate and often on purpose, very low tech technology, meaning that things are simple. So it's like a reminder of what our ancestors did with the appropriate technology that we have today. Like, you know, one of those things like the Three Sisters Guild or something like that. So even if you have zero training or if you've been into permaculture for a while today, uh, we'll be able to up our skills communally and our knowledge base and how we can integrate gardening and permaculture gardening into our lives. So before we get started, though, uh, I do want to help you and, uh, and make a request. And that request is to minimize distractions. Uh, so it, it's not for me. It's, it's for you. We learn best by focusing. Uh, so if you have your phone, if you have your phone, uh, put it on silent, right? Put it on silent and then turn it over and set it down. If you have another, other windows open or um, like my kiddos in the other room right now, uh, yeah, my beautiful little angel, my beautiful little girl. So she's over there, right? The door's closed. That way I can focus and you can focus here. The studies are, are crystal clear, right? We retain more when we're focused on what we're doing. So the focus of today is um, to show you and give you a presentation of a, um, uh, of a similar one that I gave earlier this year. Uh, well, now it's two months ago, but yesterday was a month ago in Belton, Texas at the Mother Earth News Fair. And it is on uh, an introduction to the foundations uh, of permaculture gardening. And I give an example. We're going to, we're going to go through that today. You also learn how uh, permaculture techniques make uh, growing food and your lifestyle a bit simpler, and you will also learn how to learn more. So, now I've trained 
hundreds of students, I'm oh, sorry, I've certified hundreds of students in person, I've trained in person, probably thousands. Our little YouTube channel, and, and that's in multiple countries, our little YouTube channel, um, uh, which is called School of Permaculture, uh, please go subscribe and ring the bell. Um, you know, we've garnered over 1.5 million views. I would assume that's because of the, the desire for this information to go out and uh, and, and people want to change. And right now, during these interesting times with the pandemic and the global stock market changing or crashing, uh, you know, it's very easy to see that, you know, there could be a point in time where, where money doesn't have any value. One of the reasons is because there's nothing in the stores to buy. I know when we first started this COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the stores were just wiped out, you know, uh, within the first couple of days. Um, and so we also did a couple of preparedness garden and natural medicine um, classes. And so do get on our email list. If you're here, you're, you're going to be on our email list and uh, find out how you can watch those. And those are exceptionally valuable. Um, you know, some of my most heartwarming times are when my students come up to me later and they say, look, uh, usually it's later. Uh, sometimes it's during class or, or during our training. And they say, look at what I've done to our backyard, our patio, or our five acres, or our 500 acres. And, you know, it, it, going through the permaculture design course, you know, saved us $120,000 in infrastructure. Or it made my life so much better. Or, you know, I, I, I couldn't eat food at the grocery store. I only needed to eat healthy food. And I wanted a way to grow it that wasn't going to um, cripple me. And so, you know, that's just amazing to me. It, it, it humbles me, it warms my heart, as well as when they come back, as students come back and ask me, hey, I'd like to be a teacher. Oh, that just, you know, makes my day as well. So, and speaking of, you know, uh, you, we can use more teachers, not only in permaculture, but in the school of permaculture as well. So uh, know that many of my students and myself didn't have any background in permaculture um, or gardening. You know, I, my mother, uh, she did, she did, you know, had to do some pot gardening in pots and uh, on patios as we were growing up, but uh, nothing substantial. And so I want to give you confidence that, you know, if I can learn this, if they can learn this, you can learn this and it's very inspiring. It's very fun and it will help you in your daily life. So, um, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, I really wasn't a, uh, a, you know, gardener or farmer, like I had mentioned before growing up. Matter of fact, I came from a, a business type background. I've owned the same company since 2002 and actually been doing stuff like that since 1998, uh, meaning being in business, very small business. Um, but, you know, Oh, somewhere along the line, it just made sense to me not to rely on the ups and downs of the economy, of entrepreneurship. That just wasn't very sustainable. And now that it's becoming globally known that you know, money is not going, potentially might not be able to purchase you anything. Don't get me wrong. I, I understand it makes things easier, right? I, I, I get it. But there could be a, a, a time when it doesn't. And also, you know, post, once we get over this, which we will, if you look back on it, humans have, humans, viruses. As of right now, humans continue to go, right? Viruses catch up and then pop down. So, you know, we're gonna get over it. And, and when we do, we will have at least a couple of years of people focusing on preparedness and growing their own food and producing their resources. So if you're a permaculturist, you're up at bat, right? If you're into ecological systems thinking, you're up at bat help people. Uh, people are going to want this information as you can, as we can attest right now. So, um, all right, let's provide for ourselves and the people uh, in our lives. And this is a passion for me. It's a calling as well from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to love you and help you. And that's the real goal of the School of Permaculture is to love people. And we do that through the um, the, the mentorship and the teachings that come through permaculture. So with that, let me go ahead and start a couple of slides for you and uh, let's get into today's lesson. 
Oh, and one more thing. Uh, if you like this type of thing, this is once a week learning, mm -hmm. maybe twice a week learning. So do make sure to spread the information. Uh, uh, go to our School of Permaculture Research Group Facebook, uh, Facebook group, uh, and ask to join there, like our page, know when we're coming out with these new classes. Next week, it looks like we have uh, more food growing and we're gonna be focusing on turkeys, believe it or not. So that's something to look forward to then. All right, let's get started. Oh, questions. If you have questions, there's a number of folks in this uh, class right now. And I'm gonna assume that when the questions start going, they're gonna go pretty fast. And, and you, should, you should talk amongst each other as well. So there is a Q and A button in Zoom. So if you have a question, do click that, go to the question answer section. You can post it to where it's available for everybody to see or just me. And at the end, what I typically do is I'll go and I'll um, we'll have a Q&A time at the end. You can ask all the questions and I'll read your name and I'll read the question on what it is. And I may even unmute you. And if you don't want to, if you don't want to be unmuted for whatever reason, uh, maybe you've got uh, you know, seven kids, 10 kids around that are just screaming, um, you know, just type in at the end of your question, you know, please don't unmute me and I won't do that. So, all right, we'll begin. Do a little tech. All right. If you guys can see the words permaculture gardening and introduction, put in the chat. Permaculture is awesome. When you start learning permaculture, you start learning. Um, you know, it's like normally permaculture is done through a 12-day permaculture. Permaculture is taught through a 12-day permaculture design course. And the first four days are extremely foundational. And they need to be because it's like you're building upon the lessons you learned the days prior to the successive days. And in permaculture, uh, on, on day four, we learn something called patterns. And one of the patterns is not only patterns of, of natural things of geometry and, and, and um, that kind of pattern understanding, it's also a pattern of learning. How do you learn, right? How do your emotions have patterns? How does your brain have patterns? How do people, when they come together in groups, how are those patterns? And what we learn is that, you know, the, the video is exceptionally new, right? You know hundred-ish years, I think less. Uh, books, writing is very new, but the spoken word through story and dance and singing and song, we as humans have been doing that for, you know, at least 10,000 to 12,500 BC, if we um, agree with what the anthrop anthropologists say. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to learn about a couple uh, named Sandra and Todd. All right. Sandra and Todd, or Sandra, uh, they're on their first date, and um, they, they probably use something like Zeusk, uh, me being a God-fearing man, you know, I would, uh, and I, I would say, hey, look, you know, go try Christian Mingle, but I hear that's going away as well. <laughs> so these two meet, and, you know, nervous as can be, it's their first date. And, you know, they, they like anybody in their first date, they, they're, their palms are sweaty. Uh, they can't think of the right things to say. So one of the things to do to help ease that, that anxiety is to uh, put something in your mouth. So here in uh, Texas, we have this um, uh, restaurant called Texas Roadhouse. So they end up going to Texas Roadhouse and, um, you know, obviously the food's there, not, it, it tastes very good, but it's not of the highest quality. And, you know, she's a little nervous and, you know, she doesn't want to come across as, as anything other than, you know, wonderful. So she gets a nice little salad and daintily eats it. And, you know, he wants to come across like he's some, you know, big cowboy Texan and gets a big ribeye steak, tomahawk steak or something like that. And, you know, they, they go across, they go along the merry way. 
Well, they end up actually really liking each other. And they start spending a lot more time together. And they go out to eat a lot more, of course, going out to eat. Now, let me just look at that, right? Um, they, I would highly recommend if you're into permaculture or if you're just starting, start with some research books like one called the Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan and another called Wheat Belly by Dr. Uh, you know, his name's escaping me right now. If you, if you know the name of the, the author of Wheat Belly, please put it in the chats. Those are two great books uh, to start with if, you're, if you really want to have a why for permaculture because what you're seeing on the, on the image right here is definitely um, something not to um, uh, put in your body, even though you might eat it with your, with your eyes. Well, he finally musters up the courage after some time and he asks her to marry. And she says yes. And just a little while later, you know, they really like each other, this happens. <clears throat> not too much changes in their lifestyle until Sandra talks with her friend Naomi. And Naomi has been all over the world and she's also pregnant. And she gives her like you know, the red pill and the blue pill um, and says, look, you should really look into this. You got Netflix, right? She goes, just, just watch some of these food documentaries. And she does. She spends the next week into GMO, OMG. And, and uh, look, I really like check out this one right here called Farmageddon. That's pretty eye popping. Um, and she learns about the food system and the industrial food system. And she freaks out, right? Because, you know, she's, she's pregnant. And any mother, any father who's got a baby coming starts to realize like, oh my goodness, do I want to put this fakeness, this, this artificialness into my offspring? It's one thing if it's you, right? I mean, you went on ton, tons of first dates, Sandra and Todd did, you know, drinking their, their evenings away uh, through, uh, to help calm their nerves. But it's another thing when you have a responsibility of a child to think, you know, you're just going to give them Doritos and Gatorade all day, right? <clears throat> so she's frustrated and Naomi sends her this graphic on Facebook. And it's the only way to be safe, to know what's in your food is to grow it. And look, she studies it and it says, stop mowing your lawn and start planting in it. Right? And that's something that's, especially if you're in the suburbs and even if you're in the rural area to do, and if you're in the urban area where you're only living uh, close quarters, apartments, and, and, and you only have patios, then it's not get rid of the lawn, but it's still definitely start planting. And I'm thinking two weeks from now, we might do a series just on small applications, right? Right in your patio, your window seals, because um, those are just as important, maybe indoor growing as well. So here's the funny thing. Here's the crux to this. So like so many people in society, she doesn't know what to do. Now think about this. Um, uh, let's put it in, in the chat here. How many of you uh, feel like you have the knowledge, feel like you don't have the skills to grow anything in, your, in a garden? Go ahead and just be honest. It's okay. Like I had mentioned already, I, I didn't know how to do that, right? So I didn't grow up with that. How many of you did not have parents who put emphasis on growing food? Like hardly anybody in today, which is very interesting. Yeah, like, like everybody's on this level right now, right? Almost everybody, right? So there's no shame in this whatsoever. I mean, that's, we're, we're, we're brought up to like focus on going to school, to, to like click the, to like listen to the bell, right? Uh, do some research on how today's school is actually brought up is to make factory workers or to make you um, like almost just smart enough to press the levers in the factory. Um, 
and <laughs> it just wasn't taught. And, and if you think about it, though, I mean, really think about this. Like, why did your parents teach you, uh, potty train you? Well, one of the reasons is you're going to be doing that operation pretty much every day for the rest of your life. So to not know how to take care of yourself in the bathroom, uh, you would be dependent upon other people. Not only that, you can get, I mean, that one, you can get sick and, you know, you can die from that. Also, it's being a parent, like, you know, it's a relief off of your parents as well. But, you know, take that a step further. You know, I'll, I'll be real and honest with you. Like, I didn't even really know how to cook other than the microwave until my early to mid 20s. Um, and then I just went full force, right? But I was be eating pretty much every day for the rest of my life. So if I didn't know how to cook, I'd be either eating processed food from packages that I can microwave or going to restaurants or depending on other people to cook. And if you take that a step further, right? Where does your food come from? So none of this is like out there, right? This is just common sense. It's like reality, right? The things that you do every day you should have some type of understanding of, whether it be food, whether it be, you know, most of us are in a building. So we should have an understanding of, of some type of construction. I would highly recommend natural construction, which we will also talk about later in these series, uh, in these classes, right? But think about the things you do every day. And I would say that is human common sense on what to kind of focus on and what to teach your kids as well. Now, for those of you who've had parents who teach you how to garden, obviously uh, you're doing great, but um, you know, uh, there's, there's just so much to learn no matter where you're at, you know, the, at the very beginning of learning this or if you've got 30 years experience. Okay, so back to Sandra and Todd. She doesn't know how to do this. So she calls a couple of companies to, because we're in a time period right now where we can go and hire people, right, which is a very unique thing as well um, in this time frame that we are in human existence. So she calls a couple of companies and she gives them her criteria. She goes, okay, I want to grow a lot of my own food, my produce. I want to you know, major in that stuff. And by the way, um, if you haven't watched it, do go back and watch the preparedness garden classes and the natural medicine classes with Dr. Lori Rose that we've done over the last few weeks. Uh, especially if you've never gardened, because it tells you what to focus on right now. So we're permaculture gardening, what we're talking about today, uh, it, can in, it can have a preparedness garden within it. As a matter of fact, it's kind of already embedded as a seed. I just took it out to teach the preparedness garden. Okay, so Sandra also said she wanted to have some fruits and some nuts, and uh, she wants some eggs, some chicken eggs, and she doesn't want to work so hard. I mean, she's got a belly out to here, and and look, I have a three-year-old. She just turned three. Nobody prepares you for what it's like to have a toddler or a baby, right? All you do is that. There's no complaints. It's just nobody tells you. So she's not going to have a lot of time uh, to do it. Or if they do tell you, you don't believe them or you just don't know. But you're not going to have a lot of time to do a lot of work. I mean, your focus is really, and, and Sandra's focus is really going to be on her child. So the first company, you can see the logo here, traditional landscaping company. Um, and uh, they, they, if you look at it, it looks like they've been in business 30 years, which they probably have. They look at her criteria, they study the landscape a little bit. They can tell, you know, uh, Sanders in the Northern Hemisphere, so north is this way, meaning that the sun is coming from this area, right? For all, this is the sun area. And there's a, a, a gradual slope down her landscape, as you could see what's been looked at here. Now, as a permaculturist, we learn a lot more than just those sectors or those energy sectors of sun, uh, solar orientation or slope. But for, uh, for, for understanding for this right here, this is all we need to get into, right? So here's <clears throat> exactly what she asked for. It is the chicken house right here. You get raised beds. These are all like three by, by uh, 12 foot, something like that, raised beds. There's 12 of them here. <clears throat> and this is a little seating area. This is a greenhouse because you, you, sometimes uh, it's very, very beneficial to have a greenhouse. Um, and then here's a little small orchard all put together right here. So if you think about this, this is exactly what she asked for. Exactly. 
However, <clears throat> there's some problems here. And go ahead and put in the chat, what do you think the problems might be? Good here. Pathways, erosion, monoculture, chicken coop on the wrong tin, orientation of beds. Uh, uh, we've got some permaculturists in here talking about zones. Yeah, everything is separate. Lacks an ecosystem, right? Uh, D, I love your answer. I have no idea. Uh, can't cycle crops, Naomi is saying. Yeah, all of these are kind of there. So, so let's talk about some of the big ones. Yes, those beds are orientated wrong. Uh, uh, when you said that, you're actually the first to sit to, to, to mention that. But listen, the biggest problems here are that everything is separated. Nothing connects or communicates with each other. And in permaculture, we want to connect the elements, like the waste product of one element would feed the next element. And I'm going to walk you through that here in just a second. Right, but it's all connected. And when it's disconnected like that, it's almost chaotic. And what that means is you are gonna have to do all the inputs and do all the work to make the things function well. Now, permaculture gardening isn't zero work, but we're eliminating excess work and extra work where this design, even though it hits all the points and matches the criteria of Sandra's desires, it still, as a permaculturist would look at it, it is disconnected and it's gonna create a lot of work and it doesn't self cycle itself, meaning it doesn't uh, uh, give itself its own nutrients. So she called a second company on Naomi's uh, uh, advice and she says, okay, I am going to um, call these permaculturists and they got this weird spiral happening here and all these you know, uh, turbulent looking designs. And she says, all right, you know, I'm gonna try it out. So she calls them up and then they also bring back a design for her. And, and by the way, she could have called Permaculture Consult. You can go to permacultureconsult.com and uh, my team and I, uh, we, we do accept some jobs. We're extremely busy right now, but I, I can help you go to another, um, I can recommend some other folks depending on size of your project, especially if you're suburban. I've got some really good folks that I can uh, point you towards. Uh, but if you have some time, and if you don't mind doing it virtual, uh, you can work with, with us here at Permaculture Consult as well. So here's what this Grow with Permaculture uh, company came up with right here. Oh, it's doing it. Here we go. Now their design looks a lot different. Now. They use color for whatever reason. Not sure why most landscapers and architects don't use color. Actually, I do know why, but there's nothing wrong with using color here. There's a couple more elements that are added within to this. And, you know, this is maybe too much to look at, you know, with at least 15 things to kind of study here um, as, to, as to, to really glean from this. So let's take a closer look at each one of these elements and how they relate to each other. We'll spend some time here. So let's talk about the garden. Now, and I, I mentioned when you became part of this class that I'm gonna show you the most efficient garden. And I'm gonna show you one right here because the most efficient garden is just a garden that you have to walk through. So like from your car to your front door, right? If you are forced to walk through your garden, that means you're going to tend it. I mean, I, I, we run a school and we still have times when we just absolutely ignore our garden, even though it's, you know, a lot where our food um, will come from. So forcing the design in such a way where it doesn't hinder your everyday um, path from your house to your car or whatever you're doing, uh, whatever path that you take, but going through that garden is going to put it right in front of your face. And not only that, it's aesthetically beautiful. It's aesthetically beautiful. So I've highlighted where a main portion of this garden is. 
And you can see that the pathway, well, right here, you can see my mouse. This is a carport. So this is the driveway it came in. And we have a little carport where it doesn't have walls on it. So just a roof. And then you can get out and then you can see the pathway here. The pathway goes around and then it comes around to the front of the house, right? And as she's walking through or Todd's walking through, they can go into each one of these little holes and it's like a grocery store. Each one of these little keyholes, this could be tomatoes, this could be lettuce, this could be bell peppers, this could be spinach, this could be potatoes, sweet potatoes, kale, right? and so on and so forth. But the beds, as you'll notice, they're, they're a little bit different. They weren't those rectangular beds. Now, let me just start at the, the top of this while, while I show you the difference between rectangular beds and circle keyhole beds. I have nothing against rectangular beds or rows whatsoever. For me, and many of the people, I already mentioned that sometimes we ignore our garden, right? And so we're a little bit lazy on the work in the garden. Now, I know people who are not that way at all, right? On top of it, you know, very structured. I'm just not structured. And, and it's okay. There's room in the world for everybody, right? But let me just give you some, some things to look at. Some square footage. So most rectangular beds are something like this, like three by eights, three by tens, three by twelves, four by tens, four by twelves. So for square footage purposes, it's three foot and four foot, three foot, four inches this way, and twelve feet this way. This is roughly 40 square feet. Now in this at three foot four inches and 12, this gives you, yields you 36 plants on 12 inch centers, right? So each one of these is 12 inches away from each other. And the way you work it is you work, this is you, and you're working the outside perimeter. You go around it. Right? And at a three foot four uh, inch bed, even at a three foot bed, you can work two of the rows from one side and then you work the other row from the other side. <clears throat> but if you stand in the center, like right here, if you stand in the center, you can wrap that same bed around you like this. And if it's eight feet in diameter, meaning from here to here, you get still about 40 uh, square feet of growing space. I mean, there's a slight difference. Actually, both of this one and the other one are like, like just a tad under 40 square feet, but we'll just call it 40 square feet, like literally a tad. <clears throat> but you do it like this, you also get 40 square feet, but in this particular way to put the plants together, you can get 44 plants in here. So you can get more plants in. And the fun thing about this is now you walk up to the center and instead of walking the outside perimeter, which you could do if it's one garden, you, you just well, what we, what we did in our suburban site is we put a 12 inch log, like a normal, like a tree stump that we, um, companies in the area would tear down trees and they give you the chips and oftentimes they'd have logs. So 12 inches high, you don't want much higher. You think you want higher because it feels more comfortable, but when you bend over, it actually hurts your back. Or you get a cinder block laid on its side, not the tall way on its side. And you can just sit right there. You can sit right here and from one rotating position, and if on an eight foot bed, because you don't really want to get larger than an eight foot circle. And you don't really want to get too much smaller than say six or five and a half feet as well. Right, and so at seven feet, you're looking at about 30 square feet. And at six feet, you're looking at about 20 square feet of growing space uh, when the diameter of the circle is like this. But on an eight foot, you don't really want to get much bigger than that because you can't reach the back. And even at eight foot, unless you've uh, got a very long reach you probably have to put your knee right here at the edge and then reach over back here. But, it, but it's still very comfortable and you're still in one spot rotating. Now I just put in a bunch of plant, uh, seeds on our preparedness garden on our farm. And I, uh, if you go back and look at that, we didn't, you know, I, we knew where the garden was going to be, but we're in the construction phase. So I took my own advice and the own my own, our own teachings. And I said, let's just put down a bunch of compost and plant in them. Now those rows are maybe uh, 36 inches wide, you know, and I don't know, 50, 100 feet long. And, you know, I'm straddling those rolls. And look, we were out there a lot yesterday, and I could feel it in my lower back. And it's really making me miss our keyhole circle gardens, which we will put in the design later. 
definitely now that I'm you know feeling it in my lower back. So you know you can go here from one central rotating position, and uh, you can put your headphones on. You know I can uh, listen to podcasts. You can listen to podcasts. You can listen to teachings on permaculture, or you know like Robbie Zacharias or Tim Keller or Jay Warner Wallace or uh, William Lane Craig. You know and get into some really good stuff. Uh, teachings about the Lord. So look, now you can see it. Here's a real one, you know, a little bit smaller. And these are cabbages. Right? And there's one of those tree stumps right here. Just like that. Uh, and I'll show you later, like really the only border you saw is when you looked at this one was was right here in the uh, in the pathway. You notice that there isn't a border on the edge, like you see this brown border here. Right? And we'll talk more about that and how to utilize that specifically. So take a look again, you know, if you can. Now there's a lot to look at here. And now can you see the efficiency of this design, right? You walk in, boom, boom. Right? You don't have to harvest everything at one time, especially things that like, you know, pole beans or uh, kale or any of the leafy greens or even tomatoes, right? You just have to harvest a couple as you're walking inside, going inside. It's part of your daily life. And that's good permaculture design, not, not creating extra work. So one of the things that's, that, that um, this permaculture company added in here is a vegetable washing and a probiotic station. Now it's right here, right? It's just right here, this little pink part right here. Now, what, what does that mean? So anytime that you're washing vegetables or that you're picking vegetables, you might pick up potatoes or sweet potatoes. And, and if you're not storing them and you're gonna use them right away, then you can wash them off. And there's gonna be pieces of kale, which uh, may have soiled or spoiled, or maybe there's too, there's too many uh, uh, pest holes in it. And we're gonna talk about pests a little bit later, don't worry. Um, you know, then you, you want to cut those off and wash them off. And so that's, think about like a little sink right there, right? Matter of fact, here's a good example. And um, these are some friends of mine up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada, uh, Anne and Gord Baird, uh, eco-sense.ca, I believe is their website. These guys are, are amazing. Um, <clears throat> so there's Anne explaining on video how hers works. So hers is very simple, right? Here's the washing station right here. And there's a hose that comes over. And this is where she cuts any of the, you know, the washing of the vegetation. And any of those bits, like the organic bits that she doesn't use, and the water drains down into this bucket. Now it could have been made more fancy where you had the drain automatically go to somewhere. But this is fine, right? Low tech. So all the, the organic bits and the, the water is in here. Then she takes this bucket and she puts it in this blue barrel <clears throat> that's open. Now, like I said, you could have already created this where the drain just automatically goes into there. And then that blue barrel has holes in the bottom of it. And then it fits inside, small holes, <clears throat> it fits inside this white barrel. And you'll see this white barrel, it's filled with some liquid. And inside the blue barrel, is composting worms. So every time she comes out to harvest and use this, she takes it over here, dumps out her um, vegetable or her scraps. It feeds the worms. The water goes through here, and you know this isn't rotting flesh. And then she gets to there's a little spigot right here. Harvest this probiotic effluent that the worms create, basically worm pee and a diluted worm casting tea. And then, you know, if we go back to the design, if you had two of these canisters underneath, you know, as you're walking here, you did the vegetable washing station, you came back, um, <clears throat> you, you grabbed one of the, the, the canisters, you fertilized this area like this, you left it at the door, you went inside, you came back out, uh, you either dropped it off here or you fertilize this as you went this way, All right? So that part. What an amazing thing to add to any garden because you need to, you're going to need to wash those vegetables anyway and then turn it into a, there's no better fertilizer on earth than what comes out of the back end of worms, right? It, it's, 
it was designed to be that way. They live at root level to fertilize the plants who need it at root level, right? It's the best fertilizer on earth, highly recommended. You can also just search my name, Nicholas Bertner, and um, look at a vegetable washing station or probiotic station or something like that. It's on YouTube, so you can check it out. But what about those places in, those garden, in this garden that you couldn't reach? Right? So you walked into each keyhole and you actually couldn't reach the, the back of the keyhole. So what are we gonna do there? Now I've highlighted here, you can see all these areas that on the pathway, you can't reach to them. And the garden does extend back this way as well. Well, those are the support species area. Those are the support species. <clears throat> and those are exceptionally important. Now this is where permaculture really shines. This is designing with an ecosystem. So you might ask yourself, what do support species do? Well, one of the things that they do is they grow and support soil. I mean, look at this. Look at the root mass on this plant, right? That's, that's I believe, it, let's just say he's a five foot, five foot, five foot, five inch man or, or six foot. That's a huge root mass. And everybody knows that when you uh, cut back a plant from the top, it automatically trims its roots. Now it doesn't do it like with a, with a knife, it does it through atrophy. And what do you think happens to those roots as they are no longer living in the soil? There's no machine that can give you the aeration and the penetration through the soil as roots can, and they twist and they turn. So those eventually <clears throat> will break down, but these are except and when they do that they're exceptional delivery systems for air and water and really good soil is like 50 percent air right and we and it's the plants that help do that and so we grow support species on the edge that's one of the ways that these support species help build soil another way is they grow fertilizer now how do they grow fertilizer like already uh whoa -oh. I have a little issue there. Give us one second. Here we go. If you can see the slide deck that says, uh, what do support species do? And they grow, they grow and support soil and grow fertilizer. Give me a uh, soil rocks uh, message. Awesome, all right. So <clears throat> they also grow fertilizer in more than one way. Right? One of the ways is they, like I had mentioned earlier, they go dormant, especially if they're perennial, right? Like native vegetation can go perennial. They go dormant and when they're no longer utilizing the top portions of their plants, they don't need as much root mass. And so the root mass, again, dies off into the soil. Now, I already mentioned there are pathways for water and air, but it's also compost. It's food for the microorganisms in the soil. And that's a class in and of itself, but putting the microbiota to work by giving them food because you're having support species that you don't really harvest is extremely beneficial for your gardens. So that's one way to do it, just the natural death and the life and decay cycle, the sustainable cycle of life helps build soil. The other way that this happens is by growing uh, nutrient dense species and all plants are, are nutrient accumulators, okay? So something like tansy or yarrow or comfrey, right? So those are going to grow and they're gonna start going over into your pathways, right? As you can see, lots of, here's a sidewalk. The support species are just taking over uh, this. Uh, actually, I got this tool from uh, Daniel Lawton at Permaculture Tools. It's a hand sickle, permaculturetools.com. Uh, still functions very well. A good steel, it, it does rust, but that's completely okay. It keeps its edge really nice. Um, but, you know, look, take these out just like this 
right? We clean those up, we, we pull them out of the way, and we can go and create compost with those. We can create compost with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. We also attract pollinators. That's something that's really big and on everybody's mind right now. So here's a couple of them right on one um, plant here. So you can see we've got a butterfly and hummingbirds are also pollinators as well as the bees, right? So we can even say it attracts many beneficial insects. Now that right there is a golden ticket. That's really good. Uh, for example, if you just put food plants in, right, you're going to have problems. You're going to have lots of problems. Um, in which the preparedness garden did tell you to do. The victory gardens are telling you to do. But preparedness gardens are, are a seed implanted within a permaculture garden. So by growing these support species around your garden, then what happens? You get the automatic attracting of these beneficial insects. And it kind of breaks down into two things, right? One is the pollinators coming this way. And the next one is the beneficial pesticidal insects, right? They kind of go this way. And those break down into two categories, predators and parasitoids. So how many of you have wasps in your area? Go ahead and let me know. And how many of you like despise them and try to kill them at every single opportunity that you can. You can go ahead and let us know uh, how much you despise wasps. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. This will give you another appreciation. I'm loving the comments here, y'all are hilarious. <clears throat> yeah, they don't pollinate your tomatoes. You are exactly right. So in our region of the world, we have both parasitoids and, and predator wasps. For parasitoids, we're not going to spend time talking about them today. Those are a trip, right? They take their oviposter and they implant eggs into other insects. Like there's one that only looks for roaches and it implants its eggs inside a live roach. And then its babies eat the roach from the inside out. There's another one that only implants its eggs within the eggs of a cockroach and then eats the egg from the inside out, right? So those are parasitoids. These are predators. So what you're looking at here is in that garden I just showed you earlier. <clears throat> this is a, uh, I believe it's a red hornet. And it's in the paper wasp family. So these are the, the ones that take little bits of wood that they find and mulches and they go and they put that umbrella looking thing under eaves. So what you're seeing right here is a cabbage looper in the mouth of a wasp. So wait a minute, hold on, let's, let's think about this. So we have the second best vision of all the animals in the world. Uh, the birds of prey are the only one that beats our vision. Now, but we have limitations. We can't see infrared. We can't see ultraviolet, right? Our night vision's not that great. Uh, we can see color uh, pretty darn good. <clears throat> and we can see um, both forward and lateral movement really well. But when <clears throat> these beautiful white moths that sometimes have sapphire blue eyes. When they come across brassicas, like your kale, your broccoli, your cauliflower, um, they go and they look for them in their adult form and they put their oviposter up under the leaf and in a nice little row in a little package, they put their eggs. And then their eggs hatch and they become the cabbage worm or the cabbage looper. And it's those little green, uh, larvae, and you can barely see them even with our uh, second best vision in the world of all the creatures on the world, right? Because they look like the stem of the plant, and especially when they've just hatched, they're really small. But they provide tons of havoc on your brassicas. They eat all of your cabbages. They're just completely terrible. But here's the interesting thing with these, this ecosystemic design, right? We're creating the, the flowers, which are pollen, that's a form of protein, it's the secondary source for the wasps. So the wasps are coming to eat the pollen. But also what's happening is that kale, if it's getting eaten, it throws out a distress signal. It screams, but it doesn't scream audibly. However, there's some research to say plants have a supersonic uh, sound. Um, uh, the, we're still learning, but <clears throat> it screams in a pheromone. Now we can't see it, but the wasp can. So it's up there and it's 
uh, in its nest, just kind of looking out over the garden, right? As a, as a watcher, as a protector, right? As a soldier. And it sees this distress signal that the plant is throwing up and it flies over there. Now it can't see the cabbage looper, uh, just like we can't barely see it. And maybe it can, I don't know, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and prop and make the hypothesis that it can't, but it sees the distress signal. So it lands, and it combs every leaf where the distress signal is. It finds that cabbage looper and it slices it in half, in half with its mandibles. It eats about half of it. And the blood and guts, as you can see here on these leaves, of this larvae, what do you think that's, ha what do you think is happening there? Right? Those are spilling over onto the soil, creating more soil, right? So there's like a party slash Armageddon happening in these support species boosting the soil fertility. There's a massive nutrient load. The support species are like a nutrient net. It's capturing all of this fertility over time and at micro doses, but it's those micro doses which are exceptionally important. All these little minerals that are coming from blood and, and body parts of insects, all happening in the soil. Well, after it eats about half of it, it rolls up the other half and it takes it back over to its, uh, to its nest it, put, it, it puts it in one of the holes where the larvae is, it caps it over, and then the, the reproductive cycle still continues with these paper wasps and these foundresses. Wow, is that not just awesome? If that, <clears throat> that is a foundational proponent and reason that you should definitely focus on support species. Right, your victory gardens and even your preparedness gardens, if they don't have support species around them, they will be plagued with pests. Now, if I jump back over here, way back like over here, you can see I have some holes in these leaves, but you can see all of these flowering plants behind here, they're attracting the wasps and the ladybugs and the lace wings and the praying mantis um, <clears throat> and all types of other beneficial insects. So this only got this much damage because we had like a week and a half of rain, but it stopped. They didn't eat it down to the bone. You, if you've ever had this damage, it literally eats it down to the veins. All the leaves are gone. Yeah. So I have more pests in my garden and I'm thankful for that. I thank God for that because that's the food for my predators and I have less pest damage in my garden as well. So you can see again, here's the support species areas that we've created in this garden on, on purpose. So we've also in this design created some solar panels and some rainwater tanks. Now, the reason that we're using rainwater is because tap water is chlorinated and we wanna help life. We wanna uh, about life and to have it more abundantly. We can use the sun for some solar pumps as well. Right, so you can see there's a, a rather large rain tank. And here's some solar panels that could run a pump to help irrigate it. Now, we don't have to get this fancy, but if you wanted to use a misting system, um, you know, here's a, a way to run the lines, right? You know, you have basically two misters per each bed on each side of it, and, and you run it that way. We didn't have to do this at all. We can use a reticulating sprinkler, and you just have, you know, one line that comes here and then you have sprinkler here and sprinkler here. And it's those ones that go Those will work fine. Not the best for baby plants when they're really small. Um, and what you're seeing here is basically the mainframe and the wire um, or the skeleton structure of a misting system, which, you know, can be pumped with, with this. This is from, um, uh, you know, I'm gonna have to come back and give you that link. Rainflow. This is the pump and this is the automatic switch on it. It's a really good, it's about four or five hundred bucks and something really inexpensive here. And you don't have to use this one, by the way. Uh, but this gives you like up to 65 PSI, which is usually more than what it comes out of your tap. And it's on demand, uh, which is nice. Not so good for a, for a small solar off-grid system. And, you know, this is a 15, 12, 15 dollar timer that you just set it. 
and it says, okay, I'm going to turn the misting. This, this turns the water on, and then this pumps the water, right? And then this, you know, you can say stop in five minutes, run it four times a day for five minutes or 10 minutes, and then do something like that. <clears throat> I use, for the misting system, you use something kind of like this, right? Um, the backbone is half inch, um, uh, non-porous drip, drip line, and then you take a quarter inch line, the flexible, and you run it to each one of these. It's a non-moving part. It's just shooting water up into this little red thing, and it's hitting the top of it, and psh, it sprays into a like 360 or 320 degree uh, fan. Um, and there's no moving parts on it. So there's, you know, I like that a lot because drip systems that move and it just could cause lots of problems. Um, so right in each one of those circles, you can see that's about the throw of the sprinkler, right? So you saw the, the wire frame and there's like the throw of it, how far each one of those little sprinklers will do. And so it's a nice misting system, right? And it looks like this, right? And you can kind of see it. <clears throat> so, you know, without going into too much detail, it's really awesome. It's a cool place to go out and just enjoy the watering of your garden. That's if you could choose to do it that way. Like I said, you don't have to get that intricate in it. You can use the reticulating sprinklers. Now, remember I spoke earlier that we have that harvesting of the support species for composting. So I would say a key element in every permaculture design that has to do with landscape, and even if it's an apartment, is your composting station, right? Matter of fact, we should call it a composting and a probiotic station. Um, but here's this one here. Now you'll notice that it's up here where it goes downhill, down slope to slowly give the effluent to the garden beds here and to the further portions of the, of the property. Now compost is exceptionally important. I can't say enough about it, but that's where we would go and, and harvest the, the the, pa the pathway support species that are going into the pathway, we'd take those off and some of them we'd put right onto the soil, we'd leave them there as a, as a mulch and others we would take over here to dry and uh, wait for the time for us to create compost. So we can use the Berkeley style thermophilic or hot compost and we can make compost in 18 days, right? It looks something kind of like this, right? You got a little area, started it, you tarp it, you know, and you get this beautiful um, workable material that you can plant right in in 18 days. Now greenhouses are pretty important, like I had mentioned, and notice there's a greenhouse is, not greenhouse. The first one is this large one. So if you happen to be in a place like the part of the world where we are, where we can get an all year growing season, we extend it with row covers, that's great. But there's places where it's really cold and you can't. And not only that, it's a good, even if you're in the tropics where things just grow, uh, everything is biomass. Having a greenhouse is still very important because it's where you start baby plants. Um, so things like, say you wanted to start your tomatoes, like in pots, you're not going to put them in the ground in the northern hemisphere in the middle of winter, but you can put them in pots or flats in your greenhouse, and the greenhouse has a somewhat regulated temperature, and you can start those there. You can also plant right into the ground. And one of the smart things to do is um, any plant, like if you have a larger greenhouse like this one, any early spring crop, like your beets, your lettuce greens, uh, your radishes, your turnips, things like that, that go very fast, that, that create, that come to maturity, you can harvest them fast, you plant them all here, and so you can give more room to your longer term summer crops into your garden instead of putting those here, right? You can do it either way, but that's just something, a, a little trick that you can do if you have a greenhouse to help you save space for your longer term storage crops like sweet potatoes and potatoes and corn and beans and things of that nature. There's another greenhouse here now, this company, is, I think, is just showing off at this point. This greenhouse, notice how it's attached to the house on the side that's facing the sun. And you kind of see something like this. So attached to the house. So now there's a greenhouse on the house. And this does a number of benefits. 
One of the ones is it helps regulate the temperature to the inside of the house. When it's really hot out, it helps cool the inside of the house. When it's really cool, cold out, it helps warm the inside of the house, which is fantastic. <clears throat> Another thing that it does is, you'll notice I had that blue strip or just this right here. This is a gray water planter bed. So your washing machine water or even the water that, that you're done bathing with is routed through this gray water system and grows plants for you. Right? So you don't even have, and so when it's in the dead of winter, right, it may be 30 degrees out here outside, 50 degrees in here and 75 degrees in the house or 70 and, and you can grow nice crops here, right, right into your greenhouse in the dead of winter that are automatically watered through a gray water planting bed, right, which is a smart thing to do. Remember I said, you know, learning how to construct buildings that make sense. Learning how to construct a building that heats and cools itself should be at the top of every architect's um, design methodology. You know? And permaculture helps you learn those methods. There's also a community area. Right? You know, there's another little door here. You come outside, a little pergola area, a fire pit, just like uh, the other one, but more sensible size, cozy, close. And here there's a little herb spiral that's uh, a technique that makes a ton of sense that Bill Mollison came up with in the community area. That's how you can maximize growing space. So I'll just show you a picture of, uh, there's in, in the permaculture designer's manual, this is what, how he lays it out. He gives you a planting regime there. So the plants that need the least amount of water are on the top, the plants that need the most amount of water are on the bottom. It's like a little ramp or a, a zuggerot that goes up. It's beautiful looking. You can see it just like this as a tiny pond where you can grow watercress. I highly recommend growing watercress full of nutrients. Um, also a water chestnut. I think there's a, yeah. So this is the same one, just full. So the idea here is you have up to 58 linear feet of growing space. Wow. And you put a sprinkler on the top of this with a six foot throw in diameter and one sprinkler can irrigate all this. Um, or think about that. If you had 58 linear feet this way and you had a six foot sprinkler, how many six foot sprinklers do you need to irrigate that one line? This is wrapping that line. It's very similar to the keyhole bed, right? You wrap it around you. This one wraps a line in a, in a spiral and you can have one sprinkler that irrigates the entire thing and it's beautiful. Right, this, and they're made out of all types of things. Right? This one is just made out of some bricks that look like purchased from a big box store. Well, there's also a technique in permaculture called swales. And uh, they're a tree growing system and it's a drought resistant strategy. So here's your, nat say this is natural grade, right? There's some slope to the grade here. <clears throat> and then you kind of shape the earth either with a shovel and, and this size of property you just do it with a shovel right so it kind of you know, comes down goes into this is the swale portion and that and the the earth that you move from here gets dumped on the lower side and it becomes the berm right so you can kind of see it right there there's like the the anatomy of a of a swale and right? you get your back cut level bottom firm if you want to go deep into learning this and understanding it uh, we, we teach it in the permaculture design course in great detail. And so as it starts to rain, and it's a, it's a gentle rain, right, you can see the water is soaked into the landscape. Right? So the, the earth is drinking that water. And as it becomes a heavy rain, the swale fills up. Now it's on contour as well, right? So it's purposely like perpendicular to the slope. <clears throat> and it starts to really infiltrate the subsoil. You're subterraneously hydrating the soil. And when you do that, this is passive water harvesting, right? You're not now putting a sprinkler on and putting a pump on it. This is capturing the rain and slowing, spreading and sinking it into the ground. Right? So then that's where you can plant some trees. And those trees, you know, their root systems will automatically go. They'll find the water pockets, the hydrated soil. 
So once you establish them, now you still have to irrigate the trees for the first few years because they're little babies, especially if they're uh, you know, managed fruit trees, right? That are not hardy, like you can just go and literally stomp an acorn in the ground that you found off a tree in the, uh, in, in the woods somewhere and that's probably gonna be just fine. Uh, it's made to grow that way as long, you know. The point here is, you know, in the wild, wild species do it, but if you have a cultivated like uh, tree, like a special plum or a, an apple tree, chances are you're going to need to irrigate it. Now, after that irrigation, though, if you plant them in the appropriate spots, then you no longer have to irrigate them. So, in the in trees last a long time. <clears throat> so, on this system, you can see where we put a little swale system in. Now, the water was going downhill anyway, and it was going to leave. Now, we just slowed it, right? And when this one fills up and overflows down here, catch it in a little um, pond and it overflows, overflows, and it, it goes the same place. It's just now slowed down and captured within the soil. Right? And <clears throat> on those swales, we can add an, an additional technique like a little food forest. Now, this is a small one, zone one, close to the house, an intimate food forest that you can manage. You can plant really close together and really densely. Ours in our old suburban site, we planted them five, the trees five feet apart. Everybody said, it's too close. Can't believe you do that. And the whole time, and because they're they're concerned with the with the production, and the whole time they're telling me I'm just eating on some peaches, eating on an apple, eating on a plum, a nectarine, a jujube, right? Uh, it it works. You just have to manage it when it's that close to your house, and you can manage it when it's that close to your house. So just real quick, every forest in the world has a has seven layers, your overstory, understory, brush, herbaceous layer, rhizosphere, ground cover, and vines. In effect, a forest is an ecosystem. So now we have an additional ecosystem here with plants that help each other, just like the yarrow and the tansy and the comfrey and um, support species that are growing here, um, along with your uh, trees that also help aid the other trees like nitrogen fixing trees. So now if you think about this, we have two, we have ecosystem, the whole place is an ecosystem. We've got ecosystem here, we've got ecosystem here, we've got ecosystem around here. This is going to be a really happening place. I know I felt on our suburban site that I knew we, we, we became permaculture successful when one uh, fall in the suburbs, you have to understand, in the suburbs, a wild turkey came down and visited us. I said, okay, that's it, right? It wasn't just wasps, which is amazing too. It wasn't just the birds, which we also had owls uh, come as well that were, that were picking off the, the pests that were eating our, our vegetation uh, during dusk. It was, it was great. There were tiny little owls, it was beautiful. Uh, so now you're attracting the wildlife in a beneficial way, in a beneficial way. Uh, life and life more abundantly, to have it more abundantly. Okay, now remember that chicken coop on the last one. That on the last one, what, had, what ended up happening was uh, they basically sentenced those chickens to death because she's pregnant, all right, with baby. They're way too far away from the house. It was, it was chicken Siberia. They're gonna get neglected and they're gonna die uh, with, with, not on purpose, it's just she's busy and probably never worked with chickens before. So we can put it in a more beneficial area. Yeah, see, here's where the old one was right here, right? Way far away from the house. So here's a little bit more beneficial, right? There's a door here so you can walk out not too far away. The, the chicken coop also harvests its own water right here. And with that, you can put a, a little irrigation system for the chickens where they're now drinking rainwater instead of chlorinated water uh, with those rain barrels with like chicken nipples and things like that. Uh, and this is a deep bedding system. Um, in other words, we're adding organic matter at the bottom of this chicken coop so they can scratch through it. And that eventually makes a compost as well. So really this whole area is a composting system that happens to give us chickens, uh, chicken eggs and meat. And the same thing, the effluent, right? So as this is a compost pile in here, the compost pile is, is, and this is the compost area, it's getting very nutritious here and downhill from this will be uh, um, aided by the fertigation or the irrigated fertilization through passive um, um, 
system when it rains, right, because of the slope. <clears throat> We've also chosen to grow a couple of uh, some green, some things like oats, which are very hardy, and, and wheat, and our amaranth, um, our wheat, uh, barley, and rye, any of the grains, the small grains that you can grow right here. Sorghum, right? both sorghum and amaranth you can't keep up with. Um, sweet sorghum is a super crop. Um, we can talk about another day, but now you can just grow it here, cut it, and, and throw a couple of heads in each day. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. We're having systems, we're having ecosystems that are systems. Now we're putting systems on top of systems, right? We're talking about permaculture gardening, making it very simple. Now, what you can see here is this is poultry netting, which you see in the red. Right? So we can now partition these areas off. One, two, three, four. And we can move the chickens into these ecosystems at the right time. And what they'll do is the chickens themselves are pest control. So they'll go in and they'll, part of their eating regimen too, helps feed them. They'll go in and, and they'll tear everything up if you let them, but you don't let them in there too long. But they'll eat the weeds that are there. They'll eat the weed seeds. They'll eat the pests. They love the pests. And, and the pests that will be in the forest will be different than the ones in the garden. So it's diversity of food. And then they'll eat the pest eggs, right? So they're biologically sterilizing in a bit beneficial way your ecosystem. They're, part, they're like a predator uh, to those pests and weeds. But, and at the same time, they manure everywhere. So they help fertilize each one of these, right? So you put them in at the appropriate time. And a little bit more study would be needed for that, but not a ton, right? You can experiment and learn it yourself. So now that we've understood that we've created this permaculture ecosystem design and this garden for Sandra and Todd is a problem. And one of the problems is that there's too much food. Yeah, it's a problem. So what do you do when you have that many eggs, when you have that much produce, when you have more nuts than you can than possibly eat? Well, she's also got a baby, a, a daughter that she's gonna be raising. And it's important for her to spend time with her daughter, obviously. So they created this little stand here. And it's a little a roadside stand. And you can see right here, there's some signs. So as you're driving by this main road, you say, hey, pull in. And when they created the, the, the stand, they put a little parking lot here. And the parking lot's also sloped down into the forest. So it, when rain hits it, it pushes the water into the forest system. And this is where her and her daughter, her, uh, uh, where Todd, Sandra, and their daughter can go and pick up scraps in the forest area and make little crafts, spend time together, and then take the eggs and the produce and the nuts and then put them out for sale here in this little market stand. And that also gives an opportunity to teach other beneficial things, how to negotiate, how not to take advantage of people, how to not be taken advantage of, how to work with trade, how to barter if, if that's deemed necessary, how to uh, work with real uh, math or real world math, like money math, right? What is uh, two two dollars and fifty cents? You know, was the price for something? When somebody gives you a ten, what do you give them back in change, right? So it's an opportunity to spend quality time and also a learning opportunity when it comes to community in your local neighborhood, along with all the other learning that happens here with this natural ecosystemic design. Basically telling you what I told you earlier. So let's look at a real life example and a progression. Um, let's do a little check-in before I do that. Uh, I'm gonna put you on mute for a second, just do a check-in, put in the comments, uh, if you're still here with me, everything's working really well. Say uh, permaculture gardening is, and then you fill in the blank. Permaculture gardening is, and then you fill in the blank.
All right, good deal. Let me read some of these. Better for lazy gardeners. Permaculture gardening is great. Uh, let's see. Permaculture gardening is a new hope to the world. That's awesome. Is inspiring. Is a life holistic, beautiful way. Oh, these are great. When y'all watch the replay, you can see all these comments. I hope y'all are also using the to all panelists and attendees. If you see like right where you chat, there's a little drop down, uh, and it says who can see your 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 messages. I hope you put everyone on there. Right? Permaculture gardening is exciting, awesome, and interesting. Super cool. All right. Oh, absolutely beautiful. All righty, so let's look at a real life example uh, here. So here we are <clears throat> in a front yard in April of 2015. Now we took out the grasses. We did it in a multitude of ways. I had a sod cutter, I had a mattock with a hand and took it out. Uh, hired a couple other guys to help uh, one day. Uh, and you know, taking out grasses can be a job if you don't have the right tools. <clears throat> but they're Bermuda grasses. Uh, there was a garden on, on the grasses before and the grasses just ate the garden. So then this is about a year later, right? So this is April of 15, uh, I'm sorry, it's a month later. And uh, there we are and we found this pile of rocks. Or not rocks, of, of old bricks. It looks like they were maybe a old uh, fireplace. And we went here, you can see there's a little orange here. This is a, we marked where the centers were and we created a pathway garden or pathless garden. Remember the most efficient garden is one you have to walk through. This is uh, just another version called a mandala garden. It's basically one central pathway corridor with the gardens around in a circle. So we created the pathways for that about a month later. Um, also within that time, we, we laid down a bunch of cardboard and a bunch of mulch on top of this uh, and then laid the bricks down. And then we had a little party. Um, this was a permaculture design course that we were in the midst of and we did a hands-on uh, class that day. And this was about a year later. So um, you know, it took about a year just to fill that in. <clears throat> and you can see some of the organic matter being put down onto the garden beds themselves. Then we tried a ridiculous amount of irrigation techniques. Uh, if you're gonna use these circular beds, I highly recommend not to do drip irrigation in this way. Uh, those micro jets that I showed you earlier are way better. Uh, less material used, easier to install, easier to maintain. This is a nightmare. It's like a spider web over the thing. Um, yeah, don't do not do that. It's save you a thousand dollars just by watching this slide. Um, <clears throat> some rudimentary plantings went in. I think these were tot soy and bok choy right here in September of, of 16. And in, in, in that fall and in the spring, we put down uh, the seeds for for our support species. And so this is, um, you know, April of 17. You can see the support species starting to emerge. This is when they first started emerging. And, you know, um, we were already growing here, but this is just, uh, it, it was a cold, cold spring and it was still pretty cold here at the end of March in 18. And the perennials were there, but um, they were are they're coming back out of dormancy. You can see that there. And I think in the next few slides you can see something really cool. Um, so yeah, so same. So 331 of 18 to 426. So about a month later, you see we've already got some plants coming up. Right? And here is we got corn on this side. We got some emmer wheat, uh, onions here with some cabbage another bed of cabbage and then potatoes all around here and then peppers here surrounded by support species and a malabar spinach coming up this uh, trellis right here right you can kind of see you know support species really coming into to fruition here this is all a relatively short time 
and look, you know, now a month later, look at the growth that's already happening. And this is pretty, kind of the same view, same plant plantings. And then it finally got to a point where, like, these are the support species. These are standing cypress. And I just, wow, yeah. Uh, I remember one year I was out there and a lady, I, I was head down in the garden and she said, hey, and I was whoa, I was just surprised. And she's probably 70 or 80 years old. I just want you to know that every time I walk by here, and I see all these flowers. It just really makes my day. It's like, that's just awesome to hear. And then finally, you know, we had uh, some critters running around in the garden there. That's the same plantings there in, in 18, a couple months later. Corn's up, tassels on, already got little corn on it, heads on the, on, on here. I'm in the midst of a uh, uh, potato bed here. By the way, potato flowers are absolutely gorgeous. And there's just another shot of it right there. It's just, when you look at it, and there's some tansy growing support species come free on the corners here. Just, I look at it, I just feel like it's a really good place to talk, so. <clears throat> so, obviously you can't visit me after the talk right now. We're, we're all on lockdown across the whole world. So, um, if you guys are, have stayed with me through this, um, through this exercise here. Um, uh, how many of you are gonna tell somebody about permaculture? Actually, in the comments, just put, I'm gonna tell somebody about permaculture gardening. Good deal. Awesome. All right. Now, there's some questions I'm sure you have. Uh, and continue, continue chatting there. There's some questions I'm sure you have. And so, as far as the lesson is concerned, that uh, we've concluded. We've concluded that lesson. I've got some other things to tell you as well. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and tell you now. And then we're going to get into the Q&A sessions here. Now remember, if you asked a question in the comments, <clears throat> um, you can see the amount of chats that are coming through here. Um, these are, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm really shocked and I'm really uh, humbled. Like, you know, every one of these that we've done has had 100 plus attendees. So uh, I, I, if you had a question, you put it in the chats, please go over to the Q&A session section right now and put your question in there right now. And I'm gonna go over those in just a second. So look, I'm gonna do my, uh, uh, I'm gonna close this out and then go into the Q&A. So, wow, I absolutely loved, loved this class that I just did with you. Matter of fact, I, I it, you know, it's, uh, we created a meme the other day where it's like normal conversation and it's the Trojan horse and then inside the Trojan horse was the army. And it's like uh, permaculture, right? <laughs> so we're gonna talk about it. I'm probably gonna be talking to you about permaculture and how God is so good and he created the creation that we can mimic and design ecosystems within and grow our own food and, and all that stuff. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, if you want to learn more, make sure you get on our email list, right? And be, uh, be uh, emailed when these new classes are happening every week because it's not on a set schedule right now, right? I think last time we did it on a Friday, this time we did it on Wednesday. Uh, next week, it might be on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. We'll just have to see. All right, so know when those are happening. If you want to learn more in depth, uh, I have a labor of love on a Facebook group called the School of Permaculture Research Group. So join that group. Um, that group there, I, uh, I do answer questions. It's not something that I'm active every day, but I'm active a lot on there. Um, I try not to get on Facebook. Um, like more than an hour a day is way too much, right? And then uh, do like our Facebook page and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And those in the YouTube channel, I noticed like last class that it went from 20 questions to over, I think 50 or 60 questions and I couldn't answer them all. So I'm gonna be going back and answering some of these questions, these Q and A questions on the YouTube channel um, and, and putting those there so they can be referenced later. And I'll, I'll say which class I'm referencing. The questions are gonna be good regardless uh, to get answered, but at least if you're a part of this class, we'll be able to go back and reference those on our School of Permaculture YouTube channel. Um, 
<clears throat> also, uh, since you're part of this class and you want to not only learn just the permaculture gardening aspects, but you want to learn hydrology of landscape, animal husbandry, working with uh, patterns of forests and patterns of prairie systems, and you really want to become certified as a permaculture designer to get your permaculture design certification, then make sure that you stay on the email list because I'm going to give you like a 50% discount uh, just for being here today. And that's because I want to help you and I want to love you. We already have a great price for our permaculture design course because uh, we're a nonprofit. We're 501c3 and we can do that. But by being here, y'all are going to get 50% off. So the class is 800 bucks. So you'll get the 50% uh, discount code. And I'll send that out today, most likely, if not tomorrow. Um, so uh, the next permaculture design course that we're doing is to be online in a format just like this, like you like it, uh, or like, like we're doing now, I mean, and um, uh, we'll start on July 6th, and it will basically run every Monday through Friday at like 90 minutes a day, and it will be recorded, and you'll be able to watch it for six weeks after the end of the, uh, of the class, <clears throat> but no longer after that, right? So make sure, and if you're there live, watching the class live, you get to ask the questions and get them answered live or if you're watching the replays for those six weeks you won't so if you want to get your certification you want to take it really seriously it's an awesome opportunity to do that so with that let's get into our question and answers all right so here's a question from d hayes do all veggies need six to eight hours of full sun? Uh, the answer, the easy answer to that is no, but most of the things that you like to eat, yes. So uh, as anything, you know, it, uh, when it comes to gardening, there's multiple ways to do it. So um, just, I would say, look on the seed packet and, and see what it says. However, that's a little misnomer too, because the seed packet, like, there's, there's three big planting areas, or three big zones of seed creation in the United States, right? There's the, uh, the southern, really four, there's the southern, the Midwest to eastern part, the northern climates, and then there's like the Pacific Northwest. And like the, the seeds that grow in the Pacific Northwest won't do well in the southern climate sometimes. Sometimes they do great. And so if your seed packet comes from one of the regions that you're not in, then you've got some, you know, some things to think about. So there's always wisdom in asking people who've been doing it a while in your region. Uh, there's lots of Facebook groups with people who can become mentors of yours and just give you good information. You also have to sift through that information as well. So um, I'll, I'll refer back to Farmer's Almanac, which is almanac.com, one of the oldest businesses that has been in business here in the United States that's still in business. I think it's in the top 10 of, of the first businesses that were here that are still here, <clears throat> which doesn't say an awful too much either because we're only a few hundred years old in the United States, but there's still going to be good information that you can grab there. So uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Dee. So here's one from Oh, I'm going to butcher this name and I apologize. Is it O I or O L? O T E A or O T E L A? Um, and here's her question I live in an apartment right now and definitely I'm on a permaculture journey. Awesome. Good job. I've started rooting fruit trees indoors. Plan on taking them out in the warmth and back in in the winter. My question any pointers for the apartment dwelling um, permaculturist? Um, yes, and so I, I, I do have some for you. And instead of answering just right now, well, I'll give you a quick answer, like go vertical and try to get as much sun exposure as you can because if you're on a patio or little windows, you're gonna be limited to that. And also gorilla garden. And I remember I was going past an apartment complex. We did a project at an apartment complex. And then as I was driving by one day, I looked over it and I saw this amazing garden. I was like, what is this? And a couple of families from Southeast Asia, um, I finally got out there and I talked to them one day, they didn't speak any English, as they just took over a little section of the apartments, you know, kind of off in the woods in the, it was off the main street, but it wasn't really very visible. 
and they were just creating a garden right there. They just pulled up the grass and started creating a garden. So there's that opportunity as well. But there's more details, and we are going to have another lesson um, uh, permaculture growing for, for apartments or, or small dwellings or something like that, right? I don't know what the name of it is, so stay tuned for that later. Thanks for the question. Here is a, another question from Terry Streeter. Hi, Terry. What is a good free or low cost mulch for our veggie garden? Our soil is sand and this is our first garden on our property. That's a great question. Um, so I don't know how much sand it is. If you are a sandy loam, you're in a different scenario. Um, there's no one soil type that's better than the other, but I would say in general, most of the things that you like to eat do really well in a sandy loamy soil, which is, uh, it's basically sand, silt, and clay, which are the three major components with more sand than the other two components. That would, that's how you can kind of consider a sandy loam. Um, so, but, I will say this, go back and watch my preparedness garden class and I teach you about sheet mulching or the root stout, method, root stout method of gardening or uh, lasagna gardening. Organic matter is the real key, right? So where yes, we really care about soil, but at the same time, there's parts where we don't. And when it comes to growing food, as long as it hasn't been used as a dump site or it's toxic or a gasoline station or something like that, then, then building the organic matter and mimicking nature, because that's what nature does. Nature doesn't really bear soil unless you're in the drylands, right? Then, then that's really the goal where you want to look at. Boost the organic matter, bring in the compost, create compost, bring in the worm castings. Those are the things to do. Uh, so that's a good question. Here's another one from Leslie Saxe. How are you doing, Leslie? I live in an area with a very long winter. What can I do during the winter months to grow greens and herbs? Really good question. You know, right before I did last class, I had a, a great gentleman who works for people in need uh, who don't have a lot of money build tiny homes it's in Colorado. He had a similar question. Um, so obviously greenhouses are a good way to do it. Um, but you might not have the money to invest in a greenhouse. However, in the United States, we have a company called Harbor Freight. You know, I don't know if Harbor Freight's a global company. I don't think so. And they have a fairly inexpensive greenhouse that you can utilize. Not like anything that you're buying from an inexpensive store. The quality is not great. But let's go even less expensive than that. Any translucent plastic that you can find, white plastic, where light can get through, will work. Um, and you can get some straw bales, the square ones or the rectangular ones, and then just build up a little box and then put the plastic over it and hold it down uh, either with more straw bales or however you want to hold it down. And you have yourself a, a little greenhouse or we can call it a cold frame or if you have an old door, a sliding door that's no longer being used or a big window, right? You put those on top of the straw bales. And so now you have like a little insulated area because the straw bales are all insulation and you can plant inside there. You can make even a garden bed on it. And when it becomes time for, actually you could just make it a garden bed and then put the glass or the plastic on top of it. And when it warms up enough, just take that off. So that is a inexpensive way to grow in the cold climate during the very cold times. Now, if it gets really cold and even inside of the cold frame, it starts to freeze, then greenhouses are definitely gonna be something that you need to look at. That's a good question. Um, here's a question from uh, Misha de la Mora. Um, do you have resource to check the support species typical for each area? Yes, I do. Um, well, to check them for each area. Well, um, here's the easy thing there. I have two ways I'm gonna answer this. In there, everywhere in the world, let me back up. Here's your hack. What are the support species to use? Yes, use things like yarrow, tansy, comfrey, um, dandelions, like these things that I have mentioned, use them. But here's the, the, the easy way to build an ecosystem. And in some places in the world, you can get it in a bag and they, they sell it. Like if you're in the Midwest part of the United States, down here into Texas as well, um, you can go to seedsource.com. Somebody in the chat, write uh, seed source uh, into the chat. 
um, and they sell native wildflowers. And all those flowers that you saw around the garden that I showed you earlier, they're all native wildflowers. Now, native, but here's the funny thing, native wildflowers are found all over the world, usually on the side of roads. So just during, just start paying attention. If you don't, if you're in a part of the world that doesn't sell the native wildflower seeds, then just start paying attention to those flowers. Go visit them again when they go to seed, take the seeds and throw them in the soil uh, during the spring or the fall. And they'll do their job. They're already hardy. They already have great genetics without human intervention. It's just your job to go grab the seeds and put them where they go. Also, I would recommend putting the support species at least two feet away, put the seeds at least two feet away from your garden bed because they're gonna grow up and go over and you don't want them falling over into your garden. If they fall over in your pathways, that's, we realize that's beneficial. Falling over into your garden, not so good. And some of them like the primrose family, um, they start infiltrating the garden bed um, and you know, some of them start planting their seeds in the garden bed. So give it at least two feet away from your, one at a minimum, but two is better, two feet away from your growing area to put those support species. Same with the comfrey and the tansy in the yard. They get big and, and bushy. Um, so that's a little hack. I would recommend that uh, for places in the world that don't have a place where you can buy the wildflower seeds. And uh, I'm all about not using natives, but I'm also all about using natives, especially in this scenario, because we're about trying to boost the insect life both beneficially and even the pests because they're food for the beneficials, um, which is a very interesting thing to think about. But native plants attract a minimum of four times as many insects, right? and especially some keystone species. Like if oaks grow where you're at, an oak tree like has up to 400 different types of uh, species that eat on it. It's a keystone species for the native life. So if you like bird watching and things like that, you want to have the food for the birds. And if you're putting all introduced species into your landscape, then nothing might eat them, right? Nothing might eat them. So you want to have things that the insects eat so your, past, your predators of those insects can come and eat them as well. Good question and something to think about um, to help you. Here's a question by Nick Burke. Is there any way to guide wasps or deter them from an area like the pool so they dwell near the garden, not people? Well, they like water too. So they're going to your pool most likely for the water. So if you can have a, 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 a water feature, like a little garden pond, which is a great thing to have in a permaculture garden anyhow, especially if you're raising chickens and uh, more advanced systems show you how to use the pond for chicken feed with duckweed or azola and goldfish, um, and also uh, growing food for humans, but they're looking for the water. But I would say put the water feature along with the sport species away from the pool. There's not a guarantee from there, uh, but there's, a, there's an example that could be done. Here's a question from um, uh, Ephraim. And you're gonna, I apologize if I, if I don't pronounce anybody's name correctly. Ephraim or Ephraim uh, Schultz, what plants do you recommend we plant to attract support species? Ah, I did just answer that a minute ago. Is it, here's a, a permaculture hack. Just do the native wildflowers two feet away at minimum from your garden beds. Now, let's see. Here's a question from Hilary Shugart. Why keyhole not smaller than six and a half feet? Um, so the reason you don't want to have a keyhole bed that's like less than say five and a half feet, you don't really have that much growing space at that point. You can, um, but eight feet is kind of your, your upper limit for, hu for, the, for the average human size. And I would say five and a half is at the very small end for like the low human size, the small human size. Uh, but six feet, you'll be, you'll be really good. And you still have 20 feet of growing, 20 square feet of growing area at a six foot diameter circular bed. So it's just, uh, it gets too small. You, you can't really put very many things to grow there. If you're going to go that small, I would just recommend doing a, a circle mound. Just mound up some compost in a circle or your bed in a circle, uh, like a four foot diameter circle, and then plant around the edge and put one sprinkler in the middle. Psh, there you go. 
you've got uh, a four foot circle. What's uh, what's what's two times pi squared? I think it's how you find the the perimeter of that circle. I think it's I think a four foot circle is about twelve feet in circumference. Somebody help me with that uh, real quick here on the on the chat. So what you're doing with that little circle bed, it's kind of like the herb spiral, is you got one sprinkler circling, uh, uh, going over maybe 12 linear feet, but it's all done with one sprinkler rather than a 12 foot uh, row of plants where you, and if one sprinkler does six feet, then you have up to three different sprinklers that you're needed to irrigate that. Um, so that's kind of, you know, an answer within an answer uh, with some more things to think about. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Hillary. Here's another question. Are the permaculture classes in the same format? Uh, this one. Um, yes. Our, our, our online classes are. Yes. And um, since we are transitioning to our farm, I will go ahead and record some of the things that we're doing on the farm and show those recordings during the class, like um, you know, different planting ideas, working with animals, you know, fencing, food forestry, though, things of that nature. Um, but it's live and it's actual, and you, you can ask the questions as you think about them. Uh, I, all the different methods are good. The pre-recorded have their pros and cons. The live has its pros and cons. One of the cons that we've had with the live is, you know, the internet decides to go out for two days, right? That's an issue, right? And so, but we can address those as that's happening. Um, the in-person is has pros and cons as well. Um, so, and there's multiple formats in person. So yes, the one that I had talked about earlier will be live, uh, just like this format is right here. It's a good question, thank you. Here's a question about from and uh, Andrea Zick. And what about the fungi within these ecosystems? So, um, well, I missed my question. Be like, like what? Not about the fungi. Uh, these ecosystems are very diverse. Just with the covering of the soil, you're going to get a massive boost of uh, fungal hyphae and fungal ecosystems. So, as Paul Stamet says, you you and your ecosystem, you become myconauts. Uh, so the mycology will be definitely boosted by using these ecosystems, ecosystems uh, ecosystemic design and by covering your soil with organic matter. Here's a, another question from uh, Nicholas Park. Um, I am concerned about how to navigate city ordinances regarding the appearance of property. The front lawn is prime location, but, ah, yes. Okay, so how do you go? How do we go about looking at this? So right now, C, uh, um, not CNN or was it CNN? Major news stations are talking about turning lawns into gardens or at least native wild habitat, because lawns are are it's a monocrop, um, and I want to say I think it, it's statistically there's more. We grow more lawns in the United States than any other crop. Um, and, and I, I want to say that's statistically accurate, but I, 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 it's been a while since I read this statistic. So it's, it, it's huge, but it's very unproductive. And most of the, of the species aren't from here. And I already told you how beneficial natives are to where you're at. Um, and they're not productive. Well, with the on onslaught of this pandemic with COVID, COVID-19 or with this virus, you know, it's getting people thinking about how can they secure their food and it's growing it. So there's a good chance that things may start changing. What I have said prior to this happening was there's like, if you have an HOA that is telling you what you can and cannot do on your property, first and foremost, I, I do have a little bent on that. That's about one of the most fascist un-American things you can do, especially if somebody wants to grow chickens and eat chicken eggs for their family, maybe they had some issue of health and you're an HOA telling people they can't grow their own food? Like, are you serious? Like, I mean, do, maybe do some inner moral work, um, not allowing people to grow food. 
like I said, things may change, but if, like how I would come to this before, there's only two ways that you can deal with something like that. And one is um, move, right? And if you can't move, then read The Art of War and, um, and infiltrate, become part of the board and slowly turn the tides from the inside of the HOA. HOAs in themselves are a tool. So HOAs aren't themselves bad. They're usually just made for aesthetics. And I kind of get it, but I don't when it comes to feeding people. Um, but you can utilize an HOA to say, you can't use herbicides. Instead, create an ecosystem that, uh, or pesticides. Instead, create an ecosystem that handles the pests in the area. Right, so the tool of an ecosystem can actually be turned on its head for the benefit of growing and, and native habitat. Um, that is a right prior to COVID-19, that's what I used to say. But I think things may change as this, you know, has caught the world's attention. Um, so I'm, as the director of the School of Permaculture, I'm also not going to tell you to break the law. So let's see how to word this. I, I have seen people who just do it <laughs> themselves. Um, so take that for what you will. Um, do I ever come out for consultation? Yeah, uh, globally, uh, we get hired to do con consultations. Um, uh, so you can go, you can send an email, reply back to this and we'll have a chit chat on it or go to Permaculture Consult and fill out the form there. Actually send an email instead. We are having all types of form issues. Just send an email and let's chit chat about it. Um, here's a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, do say your name, do say your name. What is the best time of year to dig swales right before rain or should we wait until the summer when it dry? We're in East Texas. So in East Texas, um, it's not too far away from me. I work in that area. I would say, yeah, right after summer, um, going into the fall rains is a good time. So uh, you don't want it too wet and you don't want it too dry. So kind of damp, and that's kind of goes for earthworks in general. Uh, the Blackland Prairie has its own uh, thing and that, that these are sub regions of Texas. It sounds like you're in the Piney Woods. Um, so there's that. Um, Coach Drew for do-it-yourself permaculture gardeners. Um, how long should I dig a swale according to the length of our garden bed? Um, so I think what you're trying to do is dig a little trench on contour and then put a garden bed below it. Uh, do I have that right? I, I hope that's what, what, I'm, what I'm understanding. So to answer that is, well, um, so, so that's a deep answer. You can have like swale-like features that are like that, that work with gardens, but swales themselves are primarily in permaculture used to grow trees. So that doesn't mean you can't garden under the trees, um, but that's something to think about there. And so if you're, you know, and I kind of put a limit on a swale that's less than a three foot level bottom in, in width, then just, uh, you know, it's a swale-like feature, you know? But I would say if you're trying to harvest water in that, just putting your beds in rows on contour and using sheet mulching would probably give you a very similar effect um, without the potential ankle buster with those small shallow trenches uh, right next to your garden bed where you're gonna be working a lot. Uh, another thing to do is you might wanna fill that those swale-like trenches or swale-like uh, features uh, right from your garden with, with gravel so you don't ankle bust as well. And so it's like a French drain, um, but that will eventually be infiltrated by roots as well. Um, hope I answered that for you uh, well, uh, Coach Drew. Um, <clears throat> somebody asked, will there be a recording of this presentation? Yes, I will send out a replay, no problem. Um, let's see here. I'm probably, I'm going to take a few more and then I'm going to, um, go to, I'm going to, uh, we're going to end it and I'm going to answer more of these questions on YouTube. Um, so here's a question from Vinaya Kulkarni. 
Hi, I am coming from part of the world where rainfall is low. So what important step I have to take to start permaculture in my land? Okay, so I'm not sure of your experience, uh, Vinaya, but I would definitely say do take a permaculture design course. Um, that's gonna be your best point of entry um, there. You can take it online like we're doing here with the school uh, or locally there with you. Um, well, actually, it's probably gonna be online. Nobody's getting together right now. We're, we're stopping a virus from spreading. Um, that's gonna help you because we, like everybody, we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And so when you take permaculture design course, it gets you the ability to focus on what you're doing, right? So um, you, know, you can read books, you can do hands-on experiments, but I would say the quickest way to kind of learn what you want to do and be, be familiarized with these ideas is to take a permaculture design course. And then, and then once you do that, then you need to have some goals. Create, like, what are you wanting to accomplish? Is it to grow a bunch of food? Is it to create native wildlife? It, or like what, or boost wildlife? What is it you're trying to do? And then once you have that, then you can break that, break, break that apart into which desires that you have, like which, you know, like keyhole garden or a swale or whatever. <clears throat> and then we can look at the landscape and do a landscape assessment and then we can find out what's there, what's going on, look at the topography, the native vegetation, look at what the region has been used for historically, and then even what it was used for with the natives prior to any kind of industrialization, and looking at all these data points, and then, and then we can start putting together a design, but after we're looking at all the consultation data, after we're looking at what are your goals, what does the landscape allow you to do? So prior to any of that though, the, the, the most cost effective way to do it. Literally I've had students save hundreds of thousands of dollars by coming through a $1,200 program, which, which you get it much better than that by being here um, uh, on their landscape because they just got some education, slowed down and said, okay, I'd rather learn. And I have um, students time and time again tell me that. It really makes me feel awesome, by the way. Um, <clears throat> good question. I'm going to do one more. Here's one from Leon Gutenberg. What do you think about combining some of Paul Gauchi's ideas and Back to Eden with everything we learned about permaculture gardening? Absolutely. Yeah, I love the Back to Eden method. Uh, one thing that is mentioned in that documentary, Back to Eden, um, is, <clears throat> uh, it, well, you have to watch it again, because if you don't pay attention, can it kind of goes by it fast, you're going to miss it and it's going to fail. So Back to Eden method is basically just putting down wood chips and planting in them. But it's not that. It's putting down composted wood chips and planting in them. And that's the key. Uh, go back to Eden gardening method will not work unless you have composted wood chips. So if you're working, so if you've got a big pile of wood chips, let them compost and then spread them out and you can plant them in. Just like it's basically a sheep mulch garden or a lasagna garden. So absolutely, absolutely no problems whatsoever. And I'll go ahead and do one more. Uh, It's a good one from Michael Mooney. When you dig up the sod, what do you do with that pile of grass, weeds, and roots? So you have options. Um, the, if you have time and you don't have a crazy HOA telling you things to look unsightly, you can put it all in a pile and put it under a tarp for half a year. Um, and everything, all the seeds in there hopefully will sprout. And then um, they probably won't, but hopefully they do and all the grasses that are still living on all those will die. Then what you wanna do is you wanna take a little bit of that soil all the time and put it into a compost. And that way any of the seeds that went dormant or didn't sprout, you'll cook them uh, into an 18 day compost, not a cold compost, an 18 day compost. And then you just start integrating that back into your garden beds. So you never really waste it. You take it off, compost it down, uh, take it off, kill all the, the the grasses and hopefully cause a lot of the seeds to sprout and die. 
and then cook it through compost and put it back into your, your garden design. So that would be optimal. Less optimal is um, haul it off somewhere or something like a Craigslist or a Facebook um, uh, group where you're getting the uh, marketplace is what it's called. You say, hey, I've got sod available here or topsoil available, come and get it. Right? And a lot of people want the sod because they're caught on the idea that that's really what they should do uh, in places rather than grow native habitat. Um, yeah. All right, so I'll go back here into looking at this, uh, these Q&As, and I'll put some Q&A on our, our YouTube channel. I want to tell you that it's awesome. It rocks being here with you, and um, I'm here to, to help, and I'm here to love you guys and do it through practical methodologies by helping you teach permaculture or whatever it, it ends up being. So um, one, thank you for allowing me to do it. And two, I hope you learned something uh, here and please help others with this information. Um, you know, even if we, this pandemic disappears tomorrow, this is real life information, right? And we've lived in this interesting world where we've been consuming and consuming without producing anything, right? like I mentioned earlier about potty training and, and growing your own food, like things that you're going to do every day, you should know something about those, eating, growing food, working with animals, <clears throat> buildings. And so uh, do learn a lot more. I love you guys a whole bunch. Uh, thank you so much. Put in the comments, um, um, uh, you know, anything you want, actually, just anything you want. And I will see you soon. You'll get a replay and um, love you again. Bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.